Thank you for joining me on another edition of the Seed Time Living Podcast. I'm your host, Bob Lodick, and I am thrilled that you are here today with us. And I am also really thrilled that I get to bring on one of my role models who I've looked up to for years and who uh, has just had a really big impact on society as a whole in terms of helping people pay off debt. Anyway, without any further ado, her name is Mary Hunt, and she is a best-selling author who has sold millions of books which is really interesting to me as I'm working on writing my first one this year. So, and you might know her from her website, Debt Proof Living, um, which has been helping people get out of debt since forever, basically. Anyway, so Mary, thank you for taking a few minutes of your time and joining me on the podcast. Oh, Bob, this is my pleasure. I am so excited to be here and to hear you your comments. It's very humbling to me, and I'm, I'm glad we finally were able to to make this podcast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Dead proof living, I understand that was like, I mean, old school, like almost before the internet, like you were doing it as like a newsletter. Is that correct? That's right. It started as Cheapskate Monthly. You might remember that mm-hmm. that name. Yeah. We've changed it because I've discovered that this whole journey is more than just being about cheap. Yeah. <laughs> you could have a reason to spend less than you earn. And so the whole idea of debt proof living, it's a way of life. Yeah, great. So I want to ask you a few questions and talk a little bit about some of the things that you overcame personally, and then also just how we can better help people live without debt. I mean, that's something that has been really important to our family. Like we paid off all of our debt and uh, (laughs) all things being equal, I much prefer to live debt free than with debt. And uh, I just think that's a really great way to live. And anyway. First question for you, and this is kind of, I'm just okay. coming at you right out of the shoot here. But okay. What one, I can handle it. Okay, great. So what I'd like to hear from you is a decision that you made or a change in maybe a belief that you had and over your entire financial life, like which one or two have been some of the most important ones? Mm, that's such a difficult question because for me, in one moment, my life changed it didn't happen overnight that I became so enamored with money as a child. And I think that there was some things lacking and I will never know for sure. And I don't choose to regret at all, but I think that I grew up with a hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, most people would say, well, that's where God needs to fit. And that's absolutely true. But I was raised in a pastor's family. So it wasn't that I was void of spiritual training. But in some way, I tried to fill a very empty, lonely, sad place in my life with money. And as a, you know, as a 11 year old child, how do you do that? So I dreamed, I -hmm. planned, and I fantasized about money and when I would get away from home. And boy, I'll tell you something, even as a believer, which I'm, I'm sure that I had an experience as a child, but it wasn't until I was much, much older that that became very real to me. And Jesus Christ became the Lord of my life. But it was through all of that that I, I realized that uh, I was trying. I, I could never make enough money to make myself. You can't make yourself happy yeah. with money. I mean, yeah. You cannot fill that part of your life. And and boy, did I try. And, and <laughs> I nearly ruined my life, nearly ruined my marriage and everything. But came to that point where I had to just realize that, and this was a tough one, the pain of the debt had to become greater than the pleasure of the purchasing and the spending. Yeah. And I'm telling you something, that pleasure principle for me was just overwhelming. And I have learned over the years that I don't think I'm alone. Our society, culture doesn't do anything to stop that. It makes it so available. So I just got really wrapped up into a very, very carnal, horrible place in my life. And of course, it pains me to even say the words because it's just so emotional to me. But I was, I drifted farther and farther and farther from the Lord because what I was doing in deceiving my husband and running up this horrible debt in lying to creditors to live to, living this terrible double lifestyle was so contrary to God's word. Of course, I would flee from that. You yeah. know, the last thing I wanted was something that would remind me. And that was a very long answer to a very short question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's great. I love that. I appreciate you sharing all that. So. If I remember reading right, you paid off over 100K of debt, like as you kind of transitioned, right? Absolutely. And my turning point, I can tell you the exact date was September of the 17th, 1982. I mean, you know, I can just, I can tell you right when it happened was when my whole life fell apart and I thought there was no redemption. And God, I think I had to get to that place. 
where he could finally get my attention. And it was an overnight experience for me. I can't say that the debt was paid back. Didn't even know how much debt it was. My husband and I, neither one had a job. We were unemployed. We had two little boys for whom I was trying to live this rich lifestyle for yeah. them, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> it was terrifying. And Bob, it was a point that I knew God had forgiven me. All the scripture verses I had learned as a child came pouring back to me. Mm -hmm. My grace is sufficient. If yeah. you will confess your sins, I am faithful to just to forgive your sins. And and I had to look at it that way. But but you know what? He didn't land $100,000 on my front porch, which is the amount. Well, it was actually more than that, that I had run up in unpaid credit card debt. Now, who knows how much I had. Yeah. You know, but that that's where we were. And no jobs. It was a completely hopeless situation. And as the world would say, the only thing we should have done was to file bankruptcy, which we didn't. It was too embarrassing. There wasn't an, was not a thought in my mind to ever do that. Mm -hmm. I made a promise to God that I would do whatever it took to pay back the debt. And Bob, for some of my life, I really meant what I said. I was in that much pain and, and I was so assured of God's forgiveness. And it was a long journey. We didn't tell anybody. My yeah. husband's parents, my parents, no, our families, none of us, none of them knew what we did. I went back to work. They knew that we had lost a business, you know, just your typical stuff that young, inexperienced people go through, but no idea about the debt. And we worked on this debt. Are you ready? For 10 long years before anyone ever knew. That's crazy. My husband, a gift from God, you know, he stuck with me. We've been married. Oh, I can't even, t I'm afraid to tell you this. We will be married 50 years in June. Congratulations. That's awesome. And that is a miracle of, of God's grace. Absolutely. So yeah. it was at the end of 10 years, we still had 12000 to pay back. And that's when we had, by then, opened up a real estate company. See, God, mm -hmm. let, your life goes on. Our boys became teenagers. They went. Uh, one of them went to college during those years. Uh, we actually moved into another house, bought another house. So life goes on. We had a plan and a plan that really, really, really worked. And that's the joy of my life is to lead others out of debt. Yeah. The thing about bankruptcy, because this is an interesting question that I get a lot. I'm sure you get a lot too. Particularly for Christians, it's easy to just say, you know, a Christian should never file for bankruptcy because he should pay back what he owes. We have, you know, scriptures and verses kind of, uh, you know, to reference with this. But then for those of us who have never been to that situation like that, you know, like I've been in debt, like we had some good amount of debt, but that was never really something we considered. We just never got to that point. I mean, but the amount of debt you had is something that's very reasonable in our society to consider bankruptcy. How right. do you talk to readers who find themselves in a situation that, you know, for all practical purposes, isn't possible, but obviously we serve the God of the impossible. But I mean, how do you handle that? I tell believers and non-believers it's the same. I, I think it's the same. If you have any other choice, you dare not file for bankruptcy. Yeah. It would be morally and ethically the wrong thing to do. And as a believer, absolutely. And when I say if you have any other way, because our laws too have changed over the years since I've been doing this. They've made it much more difficult to file for yeah. bankruptcy. Yeah. You have to go to a judge and a judge looks at your situation and often they put you into a rehab program you know, where you are restructured and all of that. Yep. But I tell people that you have many, many choices that you may not have considered. Well, maybe not many, many, but there are choices here you may not have. Have you looked at credit counseling? Have you looked to refinancing of any of that? If, you know, if, if you're on that perilous road, you're credit score is probably trashed and a lot of options have now escaped you. But for people who say, oh, I don't know, let's see, shall I file for bankruptcy or should I take out a home equity loan on the house or should I do this or should I do that? If you've got it, should I or should I? <laughs> You're not ready for that. But let me, be, let me be quick to say, not only do the laws in our country allow for bankruptcy. I think that that is a principle that goes, harkens back to biblical times. I mean, God made a provision for us. And I think that as a, as a person of faith, if it comes to the point where you are advised by counselors, you know, I don't know who those counselors might be, but have uh, wisdom and you trust and you believe that they are honoring God and they are advising you to do this. I think you thank God for that escape route, and then you humbly before him do everything you can to make sure you never go there again, ask his forgiveness, yeah. and as he blesses you in the future. Now, this is just Mary Hunt talking. This is not the Bible. No. This, is not, this is not the U.S. IRS code or any of that. I'm just saying that I think you have an obligation to, to pay it back. 
Now, while your creditors might have closed the book on that and they're not allowed to take repayment because they've already charged off or the IRS, you know, won't open those books anymore. There are certainly ways that you can do this in the future. And I have known of people who God has blessed. They have gone on to to have a roaring business or a great job where they are living below their means and they are giving back and they are helping people in remembrance of where they were and the debt that they were forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. I, I feel the same way. I've, I've said the same thing. And, you know, and again, it's one of those things I say timidly because I haven't been in the situation, but that is my belief that we can't go wrong honoring God's principles. And so if God said to do it and we do it, I just, I believe that he's going to make a way, you know, and that it's going to be to our benefit, you know. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. That's right. And, you know, I have thought about this a lot and people have talked to me about it and I'm grateful. I am so grateful that we were, I'll say it, too stupid to think about bankruptcy, yeah. <laughs> too emotionally yeah. wrought, too embarrassed, too proud, too vain, whatever it was, because I'm pretty sure, Bob, that had I not gone through the difficult times, I mean, it was a, it was a rough journey. It was a joyful journey. It was a healing journey. It was a life changing journey, but it was hard. If I had not done that, I fear that I would have been one of the statistics that say that once you file for bankruptcy, statistically, your chances of doing it again increase by 50%. Yeah. And I would have been right back there because it would have been too easy. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and I think at least I noticed from a decent amount of readers uh, who emailed, I, I don't think they understand the long term repercussions of filing for bankruptcy like it it's not yeah. just a quick fix and then it's done and you have a clean slate you know i mean that haunts you that follows you for years and it affects a lot of different purchasing decisions that you're able to make you know for years and years exactly. and and it's just an education thing where i think a lot of people just don't know and they think it's just clean slate good as new you know <laughs> And it's like, yeah. well, the thing is, most people, most people assume, and I did for quite a while, is that it's reported to your credit report for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of 10 years, unlike a charge off, unlike a 60 days late or something else that just disappears, bankruptcy is a permanent document. It is on your record forever. It's like a divorce decree. It's like a birth certificate. Yeah. It is always there and forever, even on a job application. Yeah. They used to be able to ask you, I don't know if they can anymore, have you ever filed for bankruptcy? It will always be on a mortgage application. Mm -hmm. It will always be on a car finance. They're always going to ask you. And it doesn't say in the last 10 years. It says ever. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's a black eye forever. Yeah. All right. So I want to turn this just a little bit and go a little bit of a different direction here. Here's what I'd like to find out from you. Because of your unique experience working with so many people who have paid off debt, I would like to know what some of the common denominators are of people who you have seen who have successfully paid off debt? Oh, this is quite easy. They do not live from paycheck to paycheck. They have some money in the bank. It may not be enough to pay their expenses for three months, like we hear is pretty common what you need to have. Yeah. But even some amount of money in the bank changes your attitude. Yeah. Even if you aren't willing to say that you feel dirt poor. You feel that way when you have no money in the bank and you've got a lot of debt and our emotions play a lot into it. So money in the bank, some amount, and I don't mean in your sock drawer, I mean really truly in a savings account, even if it's $400, $500, that is like an anchor. It's like a life preserver out yeah. in the middle of the ocean. It's yeah. something to hold on to. So that that's one characteristic. The next characteristic is that they are willing to take it slow. Now, yeah. I know the one thing we want to do is we want to get out of debt so fast. And so we go on these binges. It's almost like a crash diet where we're never going to eat out again. We're never going to have new clothes. We're never, the kids are never, 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 never going on vacation. We're never going to do Christmas, all of that until we're yep. out of debt. Yep. You can white knuckle that for a little while, but I have seen this happen so many times. It's like going on that diet where you're never, ever going to eat another carbohydrate. You know, yep. you can't do that forever. <laughs> it's yep. not sustainable. And getting out of debt, I think, needs to be like a slow cooker, not a pressure cooker. It's got to yep. be a slow cooker and you've got to have a plan that you're willing to stick to. And there has to be joyful moments along the way. Yep. I alluded to that. It took us finally 13 years to pay off the um, $100,000 
plus all of the interest. <laughs> and then it took us another seven years to pay off a mortgage. But we, like you, are debt-free. And I'm telling you, oh, my gosh, it's more than just joyful. It is yeah. life-changing. It yeah. has impacted our lives. So anyway, so that's the second characteristic. They're willing to take it low and slow. The third characteristic is they have a way to be accountable. Now, I, I don't mean having to meet with someone and check it off, but I have found this place that people find me as their accountability factor, people who've never met me. I mean, they hmm. they adopt my rapid debt repayment plan. They become members of my debt for living website. And also I have a free site called Everyday Cheapskate, which is more fun than anything. But anyway, they find me there and they write to me. And over the years, I have spent countless hours just communicating back and forth with people here. I'm here. I know where you are. I'm so happy that you you paid off one more credit card and we have little love fests. And, but, but that's important. That's important to know that you're on a journey and you're not alone. And so any way that you can do that. And some people are, are hesitant to be that open with their personal life. You know, money is very personal to many of us. And so that that's the next thing is that is you've got to have some money in the bank to keep you afloat. You're not going to use it. It's just there because it changes everything. You're going to go uh, slow. You're going to go according to a plan. You're not going to go crazy. Like when you get your tax return, you're not going to throw it all to that one visa bill just to get it. No, you're going to stick to your plan because every dollar that comes into your life, according to the Debt Proof Living Plan, has a purpose. Yep. And you treat every single dollar in the same way. And that is the way that's sustainable. And I've seen people take longer than I did, longer than 10 years, but they made it. And I'll tell you what, they're never going back. Yeah. Yeah. Our plan was very much like that. I and mean, we, we definitely made some major sacrifices and life changes, but I'm really thankful that I was thinking along those lines in terms of having milestones, having reasons to celebrate. And while we did cut back a lot, we still celebrated by going out to dinner here and there. And that was essential for us. And, you know, I've noticed, like, absolutely, this is one of those things where I've been doing, um, learning more and more about the Enneagram lately, like, you know, so many people. And I'm fascinated by some of the different personalities that we all have. And yeah, and I've noticed that different people respond differently. So some people who I've talked to kind of help them work through paying off their debt have a stronger tendency towards maybe the the rabbit in the uh, tail of the hare and the tortoise, yeah. where it's right. like, I just want to run as fast as I can. And then they just kind of get distracted. <laughs> yeah. And I bet yeah. you that they're that way in other areas of their life too. You oh, know, yeah. like exactly. taking a, a course, going to school, health, diet, gymnasium, all that kind of yeah. thing. One thing that I, I really want people to hear, especially if you have a family, if you've got children, as you're going through this, you're not going to get those years back. And so, to sacrifice birthday parties, to sacrifice Christmas, to sacrifice family vacations. I am just so adamant about this that we don't eliminate any area of spending from our lives unless you're, you know, a gambler or something. I don't know, something <laughs> nefarious like that. Yeah. But but you cut back, but you don't you don't ditch entertainment until you get out of debt. These years you'll never be able to relive them. You make your vacations fabulous but very, very frugal. The kids don't have to know about all this. Yeah. And don't, you know, I don't want parents to put this load of guilt and debt onto their kids. Well, we're in debt, so we can't, you know. No, that's way too much for kids to carry. So the joy of my life is to help people figure out how to do this. And yeah. it gives me a great boost as well. Yeah. So talking about some of the people who you have seen fail, and I think they're the obvious reasons for failing might be some of the opposite of what you just said in the previous one, but are there any other mindsets, attitudes, or things like that yes. <laughs> among those who fail that need to be resolved? Yes. I've never seen a fail yet that didn't start this way. It happened. We didn't know it was going to happen. We had an emergency. <laughs> and you know, whether that's a pregnancy, which, you know, for, yeah, getting out of debt and you find out you're pregnant. Well, especially if it's your first, you got the nursery and all that kind yeah. of thing, you know, yeah. or the refrigerator went out on Christmas Eve, we had to buy a new one, put it on finance. You know, it's that one little slip up. But when it stems out in an emergency, I say you didn't have a good plan. Because 
there are very, very few emergencies that we cannot anticipate, even things that may never happen. I mean, that's why we have car insurance, okay? Yeah. We, no one intends to have a car wreck, but we have that kind of insurance. And so you have to look at everything in your life. You know Christmas is coming. You can never call Christmas an emergency anymore. Yeah. You know these things, so you prepare for them. And that's the beauty of debt-proof living plan is that we're not only a plan to get out of debt, but we're a plan to sustain, to anticipate to hand credit, to do all of that. In fact, that's what my book, Seven Money Rules for Life, is all about. I mean, if you follow these simple seven rules that fit on the back of a business card, I'm not kidding, they really do. You don't have to print very small either. If you will just stick to these seven simple rules, those things aren't going to happen. You're going to be prepared and you will not find yourself falling back. But but what I'm saying, it, it's not you know falling off the boat to buy a ten thousand dollar speedboat or something hmm. you know um i shouldn't say falling off the boat um <laughs> falling off the plan to do that yeah. it, it's it's emergencies things that we think well i had no other choice i had to the car we needed tires we had to put on a credit card and yeah that's a doomful thing yeah all right so for people who might not be even convinced that it's worth the fight or the challenge to actually pay off their debt because that's one of those things that's been surprising to me. Because to me, it's like, why would you not want to be out of debt? Yeah. Like, that just seems so logical and common sense to me. But I have encountered many people who just kind of like, eh, it's not worth the battle. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say that you're falling into what our society is directing you to do. Yeah. You've become a puppet. You become a puppet because that's what the whole financial industry, Wall Street, all of them bank on is that people will live beyond their means, borrow money, pay interest, keep them in, in you know, in the big bucks. And, and that's what student loans are based upon, all of that. And when you realize that someone else is manipulating you to that, for some people that, that speaks. But I find to, to the younger generation, debt, credit card debt, student debt has become just a way of life. Well, yeah, yeah. who doesn't have it? I mean, they justify it in that way. I don't know a better way to help people see, but to scare them. I mean, you know, sometimes we just need to be scared to death because if you have all of this debt, if you have taken out a, an equity line on your home, if you have done all this and one thing goes wrong, because usually people who are deeply in debt don't have savings. 78% of Americans now admit to the fact that they don't have any. I think it's what one, less than $1,000 yeah. available. Well, that's not going to get you too far. All of a sudden, your lifestyle is no longer going to be optional. Like, oh, I carry the debt or I won't carry the debt. Okay, I'll talk. Next month, I'll think about it again. No, you won't have those options. Yeah. They're going to come after your house. You will not have food. You are going to have a very, very painful life. And then it may be hard for you to turn that back, especially if you've lost your job. So I don't know. I publish a lot of turning point stories. That's what we call them. People's real life stories of how they did this, how badly they were off. And that has been very, very instrumental in many people's lives to yeah. to understand real life like that to kind of grow up that's what it is you got to grow up yeah all right i just kind of want to tie things up with this question suppose you tell the entire world one thing about money or debt or you know any financial related thing what would that mm -hmm. be spend less than you earn <laughs> yeah that's the key folks spend yeah. less than you earn never spend it all and then we go into the next rule, save some from every single thing that comes into your life. Give some of it away. If you will follow those rules, I'm telling you, as difficult as life can be, you will have margin in your life. And that's what we all crave. We want margin. We don't want to feel like we're smothering. And that is the first money rule for life, in, as far as I'm concerned. Spend less than you earn. Don't spend it unless you've earned it. <laughs> I don't know how many ways to say that, but children can understand this. I have a three-year-old grandson. He understands this yep. because he's got the I wants. You know, I don't yeah. know if your kids have that yet. Uh, yeah, yeah they and, got it. <laughs> and, and they're not, the minute they got the I wants, every, I want everything I see, then they can start learning about this important principle that we save the money first, then we spend. And that's really failure to follow that rule is where all the trouble comes from too. Yep. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and sharing all this. Um, yeah, I, yeah, just really, really good. And I thank you so much for joining me. And um, yeah, I hope we can do it again sometime. Oh, Bob, I'd love to really. Let's do it again. All right. Well, I hope you found this helpful. We had a good time having this conversation and it was beneficial for me to have this conversation. 
And yeah, I'd just love to hear what your thoughts are on all that. And also, if you have any other suggestions for podcasts that you would like to hear, let me know over on Twitter or reach out to me over on the website, ctime.com. Have a great rest of your day. Be blessed and I'll see you next time.